This is really about being free to create what you want your life to look like. We each are our own hero. And how do we take the challenges that come our way and see those as the birth process of us becoming heroic? Can you meet that judgment that ultimately will surface with neutrality? This is the Wall Street Coach Podcast with Kim Ann Curtin. Aloha. I'm so glad you're here to watch the Wall Street Coach Podcast. I want to point you toward the TraderHeroJourney.com. That is the only Discord room of six or 7,000 Discord rooms for traders that specifically works on the mindset of a trader. You get to have office hours with me. You get to have a collection of people who are all working towards mindset, towards the different aspects of health that can contribute to mindset. There is so much information in our channels. I think you will be shocked at how much you learn about what can impact your mindset as a trader, and I really hope you'll check it out. Now enjoy this episode of my podcast. I'm looking forward to sharing this one with you. Aloha, everybody. Welcome back to the Wall Street Coach Podcast. I am so honored to have the legend himself, Stephen Eisman, on my podcast. Hi, Stephen. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Stephen and I got to meet recently when I interviewed him for The Money Show, and now just having him on my podcast is just an incredible experience for me, so I'm trying to not stay starstruck as I talk to you, Stephen. I want to talk about Stephen's background a little bit. He has over 30 years of investment experience. He's one of the most knowledgeable and respected analysts on Wall Street today. Eisman started his career at Oppenheimer and Company, one of Wall Street's largest firms, where he was ranked as an all-star analyst by both Institutional Investor and the Wall Street Journal on multiple occasions. After that, he served as partner and senior portfolio manager at Front Point Financial Services Fund, which had a huge impact on a lot of different things, including his career. Those incredible events are chronicled in Michael Lewis's book and movie, The Big Short, which tells the story of how he was able to see the OA financial crisis before it happened. That film, of course, features Steve Carell portraying Stephen as the hedge fund manager who, along with that very small handful of others, predicted the crash of 08. What was it like to just see yourself represented on the screen by Steve Carell? Well, first, it's a little weird. You know, very few people have the experience of someone portraying you on the the movies. The funny reaction I had was, um, you know, when I watched the movie, I thought it was a wonderful portrayal, but I thought he was more angry than I was. Mm. Yep. And then a few months after the movie came out, I had the opportunity to read my transcript from the Financial Crisis Commission. They had interviewed me, oh, probably 2010. So this was many years later. Actually, it might have been 2009, 9 and 10. And I read the whole transcript and I realized, no, he's right. I was that angry. That's an amazing thing that you got to read that transcript. Was that, is that public record? No, it's public record. You could, you could do a search on Google. Wow, that's phenomenal. Yeah. I didn't realize you were interviewed. Was that telecast or it was just private? No, no, it was a private uh, interview wow. in my office. Wow. And then I only got to read the transcript like, I don't know, five or six years later. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, do you feel that if you were frustrated at the time and had suggestions, do you feel like anything you educated them on has been listened to? Actually, quite a bit. I think one of the, the greatest unsung hero post financial crisis was the first vice chair of supervision, Daniel Tarullo, who came in after Dodd-Frank, and he did, I think, all the right things. You know, he, number one, crushed leverage. So, you know, firms like Citi were 40 times levered. When he was done, they were 10 times levered, which is an enormous change. And even within the 10 times levered, he required them to cut off the tails of risk. So not only was the portfolio less levered, there was a hell of a lot less risk in the portfolio. And he made them improve their, all their risk processes. Quite dramatic. I mean, really a lot changed. Yeah. Of course, yesterday, we learned today, just for the listeners, is May 3rd, 2023. 
a lot has happened happened today. But yesterday, of course, you know, we're hearing about First Republic. I'd love you to just talk about banking. You know, because we interviewed you for the Money Show a couple of weeks ago, you were saying that the crisis, financial crisis, the banking crisis, is different today. Do you still feel that same than it was in 08? Do you still feel that same way now after First? No, I do very, very much. How to put this? You know, the financial crisis of 2008 was really a crisis of the very, very large institutions, which meant that if they had gone down, that would have been the end of the U.S. economy and the global economy. It would have been a tremendous depression. But what you're seeing now is really confined to the regional banks. And it's, you know, it's quote unquote a crisis. I don't know how much of a crisis at this point, but it's a crisis of banks that have very concentrated deposit bases, which are way over the $250,000 limit. And they manage their interest rate very, risk very poorly by buying securities at the low end of rates. So they have massive mark-to-market losses on their balance sheet, which don't necessarily have to be crystallized unless they lose a lot of their deposits and then they're therefore forced to sell. That's what happened to Silicon Valley. They had the worst type of situation where the correlation amongst all the depositors was basically one because they were all venture capitalists. And then you have a series of other banks. You know, I don't want to get into the individual names. People probably know them, but um, they have similar dynamics. I mean, First Republic had a similar dynamic, a lot of business deposits, way over 250000 You know, one of the things that happened, which was I didn't anticipate, was that the weekend of Silicon Valley, the Fed, the Treasury Department came out and said that they were guaranteeing all deposits for a year. So I, I thought Sunday night, that means crisis is averted because everybody's deposits are guaranteed. Not averted. The very next day, the um, all the banks that had any type of this risk got crushed and they've continued to be crushed. They've lost a lot of deposits because I think the depositors are worried that after the year is up, they'll have the same risk. So those banks have lost a lot of deposits. Some people are very worried given that their balance sheets are upside down. So Look, planet Earth doesn't burn if a mid-sized regional bank, like, or he's one as big as Silicon Valley, goes down. But the impact on the economy is more subtle. If you have banks losing deposits, and they're losing deposits not just because of Silicon Valley, they're losing deposits because people are taking their money out of the bank, putting them in money market funds. And that's happening all over the banking sector. So when banks lose deposits, they tighten lending standards. They have to because they, can, they can't make as many loans. So they're going to make fewer loans. And that's going to have a negative impact on the economy. Now, how much of a negative impact? Unclear to say at this point. Yeah. What do you... But it's not positive. No, it's not. Uh, what do you feel about Powell today with the 25 you know, raising rates today? You know, I think that's pretty anticipated. He raised 25, changed the language to say, maybe we'll raise, maybe we won't. I mean, as I'm speaking, I think the market is down. Maybe the, the market's hope for even more dovish statements. You know, some of the data that came out today, like the ADP employment data were very strong. The ISM prices paid was still very strong. So I think people are worried maybe he'll raise more. But then again, you know, if the banks tightening standards have an impact, maybe he won't. We'll see. Yeah. We talked, I can't get enough of this conversation around you said this wonderful quote that paradigms are things you inhabit. They're not perspectives, but you're in, inside of them. I'd love you to just talk about that with these listeners here, because I think that is just, it's such a philosophical kind of approach. And yet it just makes so much common sense that you can't sometimes see you're stuck in a paradigm. What do you feel investors and traders need to shift into? for their new paradigm? Well, first of all, I think they need to understand what, what's the potential here. The word, modern word paradigm was created by Thomas Kuhn in 1962, published <laughs> the year I was born. Please don't do the math. And it was called the uh, Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And what he, now he confined this to physics. What he basically argued was that people, you know, scientists believe in their paradigm for very long stretches of time until a new paradigm emerges, but they don't give up their paradigm easily. 
I think that can be very much translated to investing. There are two ways investment paradigms and time. People realize it's not working anymore, or you get hit overhead by two bikes. So let me describe that. In the 90s, one of the major paradigm was invest in large multinational companies like GE, best companies, best management, best long-term growth. That lasted most of the 90s until around the year 2000, when it started to become clear that wasn't really the case anymore, like GE, for example. And people moved on. But that took time. Then what did they move on to? They moved on to large investment banking bank companies because they had great earnings dynamics. They were managed by geniuses, quote unquote. They knew how to run their risk, quote unquote. And that lasted basically from 2002 through, call it mid-2008. And then that ended crushingly. So that's, that's my two by four analogy. And then people moved on because they had to move on. Yeah. And then the next paradigm, which has lasted a very long time, which really I think began around 2010 ish, 11, was in let's bet investing growth stocks and largely tech growth stock. People don't remember that from 2001 to 2007, tech stocks did nothing. Did not what? And then they did not they what? did nothing. They were flat. And then, you know, in the decade of 2000, after 2010, they tough. So why? Well, they are very innovative companies. That's true. But probably more importantly, was the Fed cut rates to zero. And because of the discounting mechanism, you were essentially paid to take risk. So the stocks that did best were growth stocks. And at the end of, the, of those years, the stocks that did best were what you would call hyper growth stocks. You know, companies with very, very high, relatively small, very, very high revenue growth, no or negative earnings. And then in 2022, the dynamics changed. The Fed started raising rates. All of tech corrected, but the stocks that corrected the most when they hyper growth stock. And when I mean corrected, I mean corrected. They went down 75 to 90%. But like I said, people don't abandon their paradigms easily. I think we're going through this process of moving. You know, tech stocks have done very well this year, but not the hyper growth ones. It's the, you know, the traditional ones like NVIDIA, et cetera. But I think what's going to happen is people are going to be surprised that rates are going to stay higher for longer. That's my bet. Assuming that's true. Not that you want to invest anything in tech, but you're not going to be so dramatically overweight tech, which is those are the people that have done the best in the 2010. So be more diversified. You'll invest some in bonds because bonds are very attractive. I mean, remote of treasuries, for example, are 5.15%. You'll invest in other themes like infrastructure, the reshoring of businesses in America. It's going to be much more diversified portfolio and I also believe that an old concept is going to come back, which is what's called risk-adjusted returns, meaning what are your returns given the amount of risk that you're taking? So I think that's where we're going to move. And I'm sure there'll be other things that, that happen that I'm not anticipating, but I think it's going to be a new world, but it's going to take some time to move there. The analogy I like to draw is that when the Israelites were taken out of Egypt, it's a little funny, but with, I really, I'm serious about it. When the Israelites came out of Egypt and then committed the golden calf sin, God decreed that the first generation of Israelites would not be allowed to come to the promised land. So Moses marched them around the desert for 40 years until the entire first generation died. And then Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land. And Joshua took the second generation into the promised land. And that's when that's and that's when the basically the Bible part of the story ends to the book of Joshua. My father would be very proud if I was saying this. And and so my analogy is how long is it gonna take for the paradigm to move? Well, hopefully it's not gonna be 40 years. Yeah. But maybe it'll take two. So how do you because I'm all as a coach, I am always looking at people's mindset, helping them to look at their mindsets, look at where they have, they're attached, right? Where they find themselves stuck in just being right. When you go over your career, and especially with what happened to 08, was there a wrestling within you to stand in that place of solitary? I mean, Nobody around you is seeing what you're seeing. And how did you even allow yourself to come out of the paradigm you had at the time? 
What do you think facilitated your courage and willingness to see this was happening when nobody else was seeing it? Well, you know, look, everybody's a product of their history. Now, my history was in the 90s. I was a sell site analyst. And one of the, I was a financial services analyst at Oppenheimer. And one of the groups that I covered was the first generation of subprime mortgage companies. Oh, wow. And for reasons that we don't need to go into because they're somewhat complicated, that first generation basically got wiped out in 98. Now, I did a lot of research back then. I anticipated some of that. But the funny thing was that in 2002 and 2003, when the second generation of subprime mortgage companies went public, the irony was that it was the same CEOs of the first generation of subprime mortgage company. They just changed the names. So I knew this was like, since it, since it happened once before and people don't change, I figured this was a tragedy in three acts. And the only question is when's act three? So I was anticipating it for a long time, only because of my history. Yes. And when I realized that it was going to unwind was that in the summer of 2006, the securitization data was showing that loans made in early 2006 were going bad very rapidly. So my timing for once in my life was really good. But, you know, one of the lessons in life is in our business, if you're too early, you're wrong. Yeah. So, you know, think about all the people who have been fighting the, the paradigm of 2010 by talking about valuation. They got wiped out. Yeah. So. One of the hard things about fighting the trend is your timing has to be very good. Yeah. Because otherwise, like I said, in our business, if you're too early, you're wrong. And you could be badly wrong. Yeah. How did you find yourself able to determine whether your timing was correct? And then also just how did you sleep at night if you did in that period of time? Well, I knew my timing was very close because the data was getting bad so quickly. What was difficult was that I was, you know, my, my team and I were pretty much standing alone for a while and everybody was, was telling us that we were wrong. I remember I had a funny meeting with the head of research of these, the head of, of research of the securitization department. I think it was Bear Stearns. And he basically came in and said, there's nothing wrong with the securitization market because since World War II, housing prices on a national basis in the United States have never gone down. And I looked at him and I said, is that like a law of physics or is that, or is that not a law of physics? And he sort of treated it like a law of physics and I realized, yeah, this guy's delusional. Totally. Wow. So, okay, you said you responded that way, but like truly, how do you keep how do you keep a straight face in the face of that and confidence? I mean, I, I just can't imagine at times you didn't think like, am I crazy or are all of these people crazy? Like I said, we were, I was very, I'm always been very data driven. Yeah. And the securitization market puts out credit quality data literally every month. Wow. So you can check, there's one of the few, you know, look, if you're fighting tech stocks that are going up all the time, you know, they keep beating earnings. You, your stand is that the valuation is wrong. You don't have any data that they're going to miss. You're just fighting a valuation. Valuation shorts are very difficult, almost impossible, unless rates start to go up and the paradigm shifts. 2007, you know, you basically, your thesis got checked every month. And as long as the credit quality continued to deteriorate, you got to confirm by it. So it was easier. Yes. It's just uh, so inspiring to just see, of course, you know, through the book and the movie, just that ability to, I also saw you constantly double and triple checking yourself and your premise and your team's premise. Like, did you do all that data? Did they really go to Florida and Vegas to see like the results of them was that, did you really, they act almost like you're all private investigators making sure that what you thought was the case was the case. Well, the, I went on the Vegas trip, not the Florida trip. Okay. The Vegas trip really wasn't a data trip. The Vegas trip was to see the mindset of all the people on the other side. And what we realized was they didn't have any data that, other than we had, and they were just interpreting it wrong. The Florida trip was just to see how crazy the housing market was. Yeah. So yeah. my colleagues went on that. I did not. Yeah. 
But it just, it lent, I imagine it lent gravitas to those numbers you were seeing monthly, that it was like real in three-dimensional form. It's That's just, true. It's just a phenomenal, you know, just, just the journey of being able to be outside of that current paradigm. That's what's so impressive to me. You know, we could get back to what's happening now. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is not yet a credit issue. You know, I would say this from a regional bank perspective, not the large banks, from the regional bank perspective, this has probably been the worst earning season probably since the crisis. And yet we haven't even had a credit cycle yet. That's the ironic part. What's happened is net interest margins, almost all these regional banks have missed. And even those that haven't missed have basically guided down. And the reason for that is that with deposits leaving to money market funds, what they're losing non-interest bearing deposits, and they've had to increase interest bearing deposits. So everybody's net interest margin is going in the wrong direction. And then you have fees, you have problems with fees elsewhere, expenses are too high, and you've had a very bad earnings season. What potentially is the credit issue? And I don't think it's a consumer credit issue at this point because employment levels are still too high. There's no real evidence that the consumer, at least on a credit basis, is stressed. You know, assuming jobs start doing well, you could have something of a normalization of consumer credit, but that's not a calamity at all. It just means, you know, you have to increase provision somewhat, but big deal. Mm -hmm. Where... You could have real issues is in commercial real estate and, but really mostly in the office real estate. That's where you have real problems. And just to give you an example, you know, you hear from lenders, for example, this isn't confined to the regional banks. The large banks don't have that big exposure to it because what they do is they make these loans and they securitize them and then, and sell them. So they have very, not that much exposure. The regional banks make the loans to keep. And so when you look at office, you know, a lot of these loans were made years ago where the loan to value ratio, let's say, was 60%. But because of the combination of higher rates, and we all know what's happening to how many people go back to their office, so the cash flows are worse, the LTVs are probably at least 100% at this point. Now, it's not clear how, whether it's 100%, slightly less, slightly more, but it's a problem. That's where you, I think you're going to see the credit issues coming in the next year or so. But consumer credit issues can be quick. Commercial real estate credit issues can take a long time to sort of unfold. But that's what I think a lot of investors are focusing on. They're trying to figure out who has the, after this earnings season, we all know what has happened, but they're trying to figure out who has exposure to commercial real estate and what, what type of commercial real estate. Because we're going to go to Twitter space in a few minutes, I think my last question in this format will just be, what are you telling the clients that you are working with now? What do you feel is the best place for investors to pivot to? Well, you know, I have two partners. So we're the Eisman Group. What, so what are we telling? We're telling people, look, we, we have raised some cash for you. We're not trying to chase things. You have a very diversified portfolio. It should hold up quite well, assuming that things slow down. You know, if we're wrong and things are fine, we could always we have dry powder to add to things. But assuming that things get worse, we'd probably raise a little bit more cash and invest it in three month treasuries, which or or maybe some bonds. Because three month treasuries are 5.15%. You know, the problem that you have with clients is that they've made so much money over the years that when, if you sell something, they have massive capital gains. So that has to be managed and managed very carefully. You know, the risk profile has to be looked at very carefully. But, and for those clients who we can, we've gone the process of investing in some treasuries. And bonds. How much will do for other clients is a little early to say. I mean, there's no guarantee at this point that we're going into a recession. I mean, yes, 
the Fed has raised rates a lot. Yes, what's happened to the banks means credit will be tightened, so there'll be fewer loans. But the consumer is still in good shape. Unemployment numbers are still very, very strong. So it's not clear at this point what's really going to happen. I think you need to be, you don't need to go too far on each side. And then as the data comes in, you can make some decisions. I, I don't think it will become clear which way we're going for at least another several months. And would you just tell the listeners, if anybody's interested in reaching out to you, you know, what the kind of clients you do consider working with? So we do individual, it's long only. We do individual individuals, families, multi-generational. We generally take accounts minimum of 500000 to a million. Anybody who's listening wants to invest, they can email me at steven.eisman at nb.com. Like I said, multi-generational. So, you know, we start with grandpa when grandpa was a grandpa. And then we invest for their, his sons, who's now not, he's the father. And then we also invest for the grandchildren. Yeah. So we know these clients very, very well. We've known them for a very long time. And because we know them for a very long time, we're, we don't just think of it as, oh, this is the portfolio we're going to invest. There's, there's a face behind the name. Yes. And, we, and because of that, we take that very, very seriously. Yeah. We, f- we feel like we're stewards of your capital. So we want to make you money. Hopefully we can outperform. Mm-hmm. But also just as important that in, in the downtimes, we're not taking so much risk that what we're trying to do is preserve your capital. So we want to make money for you and preserve your capital. Basically, what we do is risk-adjusted returns. Now, that's gone out of favor for very long because people have invested in tech and they've rolled the dice and they've won. But like I said, if the paradigm shifts, you don't want to be so overweight tech or growth stocks. I remember in one interview you said about people really want to avoid being the hero in this environment. And I thought that was... But you know what? You don't want to get over your skis. I mean, put it this way. If we go into a recession or a bad recession and you're overweight growth stocks, you're going to get hurt very badly. If you're like us and, and you're much more diversified and the economy is fine, the worst that will happen is you'll make money, but you'll make less than the market. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, if things get bad, you will certainly lose a hell of a lot less with us than you will lose with people who are way overweight growth stocks. So the question that the individual has to ask is, yep. what do you want and how much risk do you want to take? Yep. Yep. It's a perfect way to end part one. We're going to go over to Twitter Space now. Aloha, everybody. Welcome so much to this Twitter space. I am Tim Ann Curtin, the Wall Street coach. I have the only Discord room dedicated to supporting the mindset of traders and investors called TraderHeroJourney.com. I'm very excited today to have Stephen Eisman in his first Twitter space. We have Grant Williams, who's going to join this conversation and co-host along with me. Stephen, of course, is a legend, as so many of you already know. I'm just going to read a little bit about his formal bio so you have a context. He, of course, gained fame after winning uh, his winning bets against the U.S. housing market, as featured in Michael Lewis's book, The Big Short. Uh, With over 32 years of industry experience, Stephen is a senior portfolio manager at Newberg Berman's private asset management division, where he joined in 2014. So part of what I love about Stephen is that he tells it like it is, has a no-nonsense approach. And prior to Newberger Berman, he founded and managed Emory Partners and was also partner and senior portfolio manager of Front Point Financial Services Fund. I just had the good fortune to spend 30 minutes with Stephen for my podcast. This will be weaved into that podcast and we'll release it in two weeks. So be sure to keep an eye out for the full conversation with Stephen, which will drop in about two weeks. Stephen, thank you for being on this Twitter space. How does it feel to be on your first Twitter space? Uh, I don't know. Let's see how it's going. Okay, good, good. One of the things that I really wanted to speak about was, you know, of course, Jerome Powell's comments today about raising rates. Just wonder if you can just share your thoughts with those who are here about what your take is on what's, you know, what his decision is today. Sure. 
you know, I think the problem the Fed is having right now is that the data is still very, very strong. This morning, the ADP employment numbers came out and they were much higher than expected. The ISM prices paid was slightly higher than expected. So what I think the Fed is hoping is that, you know, the tightening of lending standards will have an impact on the economy and inflation. The problem is that near term, that takes a while for it to roll through the system. So my expectation is that between now and the next Fed meeting, it's more likely than not that the data will still be fairly inflationary. But we'll see. Jim. We got an opportunity a few minutes ago in the first part of the podcast to talk a little bit about what's happening with the banks. But first, I just want to say, I'm so glad you're here. Grant Williams, thank you for co-hosting the space with me today. Hey, hey Kim, it's great to be here. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? Good. Very good. So just tell us where you stand, Stephen, on what's just happened in the First Republic and just your take in the difference between 08 and now. And we are hearing a little bit of feedback, but that could just be the background noise. Look, 2008 was a calamity in the sense that the problem was largely the very large investment banks and banks. And if those banks had been allowed to go down, the country and the world would have gone into a massive depression. You know, what I like to say is that if Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and J.P. Morgan go down, planet Earth burns. Now, the large investment banks and banks are in unbelievably good shape from a capital liquidity perspective. And that's largely to the work that was done by the first vice chair of the Fed, Daniel Tarullo. The problem that we're having now is largely confined to regional banks. And to regional banks like Silicon Valley that have depositors far above the 250,000. So when Silicon Valley went down and the Fed and the Treasury announced on Sunday night that they were guaranteeing all deposits, I actually thought that the crisis was over because if everybody's deposits are guaranteed, what's everybody worried about? And I was wrong because on Monday, the bank stocks got crushed. And what was really happening behind the scenes is that business depositors probably thought, okay, the Fed's guaranteeing deposits for a year, but what happens after that year? I don't want you to be a depositor, like a depositor in Silicon Valley. I have to move my money. So they've moved my, their money out of some of these regional banks that have similar type characteristics in Silicon Valley. And the other thing that's hurting the banks just from an earnings perspective is that with rates are higher, depositors are moving their money out of the banks and into money market. So this quarter, when the regional banks reported, it's probably the worst quarter that people have seen in regional banks probably since the crisis. And it's not a, was not a credit issue. It was a net interest margin issue. Although what I like to say is that this was a terrible quarter. And we haven't even had a credit cycle yet. And if anybody's asking me, where's the next credit cycle going to happen? I'm pretty convinced it's not going to happen in the consumer. I think the worst that would happen is that if we have, and I'd say if we have a recession, credit quality in the consumer will normalize from exceptionally low levels. So banks will have to increase their provisions, but not a terrible situation. The potential bad area is in office real estate. And that will be in the CMBS market and in certain regional banks where loans were made to office buildings at cap rates that were subterranean. And now with rates much higher, the values of the buildings are much lower and the cash flows are worse because people don't work in the office as much as they ever had. So how much the value of those buildings are down, nobody really knows because things have traded very, have not traded yet, but we do know that Brookfield and Blackstone have given some A-quality buildings back to their lenders. I'm curious, Grant, if you have any questions in reference to what Steve just said and or about Peter. Yeah, Steve, I was going to ask you, we, we had a fascinating chat a week or so ago about paradigm shifts. And so <laughs> with that in mind, what you've just, I was just going to ask you about commercial real estate, because that obviously is probably the big difference between 08 and now. It's a problem similar in nature, but perhaps more problematic, particularly as 50% of that CRE lending is in these mid-sized banks. So with your kind of theme of paradigm shifts in play, what does this paradigm look like, particularly given the Fed's action today? Is that paradigm shifting again into a more likely easing cycle and a more likely acknowledgement of a potential recession incoming? 
I mean, look, the consensus is that the Fed's going to cut rates as second as a reserve. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but I have doubts. I think the Fed is literally petrified that they will make the mistake that Volcker made in the early 80s, where he raised interest rates and then he cut them. And then inflation started soaring again and he had to raise rates to 17%. I think Powell is really afraid of that happening. And so my guess is, you know, maybe they stop here or maybe they raise rates another one or two times. And then assuming, and that's a big assumption, there's a recession, they may be a lot slower to cut rates if cut rates at all because of their, because of they feel if they do, inflation could rear its ugly head again. I just don't think the markets are priced for that kind of risk at this point. But again, it's not clear whether there's going to be a recession or not. So it's hard to say. Well, Steve, what do you think the world looks like if the Fed do stay up here for longer than people believe currently? I think you're right. Everyone just leaves it. The pivot is imminent and inevitable. But what does the world look like? How does that reality, do you think, play out in different risk asset markets? You know, I've talked about paradigm shift in various places. The par- most recent paradigm for investing was and is that because the Fed cut rates to zero, you were really paid to take a lot of risk. And so what stocks did the best in the 2010s through 2021? Those were tech stocks, growth tech stocks. And in the last few years of the cycle, the stocks that did the best were you'd call the hyper growth stocks, companies with very big revenue growth and negative earnings. Now, the hyper growth stock story did end in 2022. Those stocks were down 70 to 90%. So I don't think anybody's ever going to really return to those stocks. The question is, are people going to migrate somewhat from tech stocks into other themes? I think if rates stay higher for longer, or even if the Fed cuts rates, but keeps them relatively high, I don't think you're going to be paid to overweight tech like you were paid to overweight tech in the past. Maybe you equal weight tech and you'll confine it to very large innovative companies. But I think you will have to diversify into other te- into other themes, like infrastructure, reshoring into of the industrial world, but the supply chain back into America. I think people will invest more in bonds and treasuries because rates are much higher. You know, as I like to point out, month treasury is at 5.15 percent nothing wrong with that and a concept that has been dead for a very long time i think is going to come back which is risk adjusted yields meaning how much risk are you taking for what kind of return and i think it's going to become over time more important to manage your risk carefully rather than just overweight tech where you're taking a lot of risk. That's what I think is coming back. But we'll see, you know, paradigm shifts aren't clear until they actually happen. I'm just going to read the quote that I heard you say, Stephen, in that interview. Paradigms are so deeply embedded in your head that you don't even know that they are there. You don't believe in your paradigm, you inhabit it. And that is just something I think that should be on everybody's desk because it's so easy to slip into the way it's always been. And to come out of it, like you said, is hard. It is hard. I think on Grant's show, I gave an analogy, which I still love, so I want to repeat it, which is that when, I mean, the question is, how long does a paradigm shift take? And the analogy I like to draw is that when the Israelites got taken out of Egypt, because of the sin of the golden calf, God decreed that the, the first generation of Israelites were not allowed to enter the promised land. So as a result, Moses marched them around the desert for 40 years until the entire first generation died. And then even Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land. And the second generation of Israelites were brought into the promised land by Joshua. So the question is, how long does a paradigm shift take? Hopefully not 40 years. I'm hoping for two. (laughs) If you have questions, please raise your hand so we can take your question for Stephen to hear. And if you're enjoying this conversation, please tweet it out to your followers to come and listen to this legend and his wisdom. Grant, did you have uh, another question? I have some more too, but 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. I've got plenty, plenty of questions. I've always got plenty of questions. Because <laughs> I'm always finding myself confused, by the way. <laughs> Steve, you know, we, you're, again, we, we're coming back to the side of, of paradigm shifts. And with that in mind, there are an awful lot of people around the world investing today who have built their careers in one very particular paradigm, a paradigm that has been incredibly friendly with really tailwinds everywhere and just a few blips on the radar. What advice can you give people in terms of, of how you mentally recognize paradigm shifts and go about adjusting really an entire worldview for a lot of people and, and the importance of being able to do that? So I look, I think if you had approached one of the CEOs of one of the large banks and said, listen, the, you know, the basis of your earnings is wrong because all you have done is lever your balance sheet. I think what they would have returned, look at you like you're a lunatic and said, I made $50 million last year. How could I be wrong? I think there's some similarities to that today in that for the last 10 years, investors who have piled into tech stocks have made a fortune. And when you've made a fortune, you certainly have a lot of confidence that you're right because you've been right for so long. But you have to be open to the fact that nothing lasts forever and styles of investing change. And at least pay attention because maybe you're right and maybe you're wrong, but watch carefully because we could be in a changing environment and don't stick your head in the sand because you've done so well for so long. In the first part of the conversation that I got to have with Stephen before, we talked a little bit about how I asked him how he was able to stand in such small company back in 2006, 2007. And Stephen talked a little bit just about the data that you were perceiving and keeping your eyes open to that. Would you just talk a little bit about what it was like then, but also what it's like now sure. for you? I actually, th I actually think standing against the grain now is harder than 2006. Really? How so? And I think that because what you had to really follow in 2006 and seven was the securitization credit quality data. Now, thankfully, that data comes out every month. So if you subscribe to Moody's or S&P and get the data every single month, you can look. And if the data continues to deteriorate, you, you can have the strength to say, I'm right. If the data had gone the other way, we would have had, the, I think, the flexibility to say we wrong. But it kept deteriorating. The story of the 2010 is not a data-driven situation because tech stocks, in terms of their earnings, did very well. If your argument was solely that the valuations are wrong and you shorted these stocks, you got carried out. You did not have data that said that the earnings of these companies were going to deteriorate. Now, some of them deteriorated last year because of the pull forward from COVID, but that was just a short-term phenomenon. What has changed is that rates are higher. So because of the discounting mechanism, the valuation are too high. But the hardest short in the world is what I would call a pure valuation short. But I do think, so I don't necessarily think any of these tech stocks are shorts, but I just think that if rates stay higher for longer, you're not going to make anywhere close to the same money that you did in the past when rates were zero. But like I said, in 2006, seven and eight, you had data that you got confirmed about every single month. You don't have that in this situation. This is Steven Eisman, 32 year veteran of the markets. Of course, he has portrayed in Michael Lewis's book, The Big Short. Be sure to follow Stephen on Twitter. He has very few followers because his profile is recent and new. He did do a little strong arm to get that done because I know his wisdom has to be shared with so many. So please make sure to follow him and also listen to Grant Williams' interview of him. It was just John, was it a week ago, Grant? Two weeks ago? When was that? When did that drop? Yeah, but uh, yeah, we we ago, yeah, yeah. And if you're enjoying this conversation, please tweet about it, Stephen. Just curious, what it is right now you're advising the investors that are working with you? What is your take on how to proceed in this environment? I think what look with the type of investors that we have are multi generational that we have known 
for a very long time. So when we look at the portfolios of individuals, my partners and I in the Eisman Group, this is not a number. This is not a mutual fund. There, we know that there are real people behind these names, and we know them all. And so when we're telling our investors that we've gone through a process in the last several months, we literally have contacted everyone, is that this is a very unique environment where the combination of factors of COVID, of high levels of employment, inflation, and the Fed raising rates all at the same time, and reshoring and greenification, you've never really had this. So it's very difficult to make a very large overweighting of anything in this time of environment. You don't want to be a hero. You want to be careful. You want to make money for your clients, but you also want to preserve their capital in case you know, we have a recession. But we're not at this point willing to make that bet. I mean, clearly what's happened to the deposit base of the regional banks means that the banks are going to be tightening underwriting standards. On the margin, that has a negative impact on the economy. Is that margin big enough to tip the country into a recession? I don't think anybody knows at this point. because We've never had a situation where regional banks have lost deposits so quickly. So we'll see. Like I said, don't be a hero. Be careful. I'm just curious how and where you, I'm just curious, how do you choose what to listen to and how do you keep the noise down? There's so much out there now, especially social media within instant seconds of while he was talking, there was countless tweets about what Powell said today. How do you yourself and your partners even pick and choose what and where to get your information and data? so that you're not overwhelmed by the noise. Well, look, we have at Newberger Brownman, which is on the hat, we have probably more access to information than almost 99% of the population. You know, we have companies coming in every single day. They come in constantly. You get to see them over and over again. You get to see a change in tone. You know what? What my partners, I think, is you know, try and absorb as much information as possible and then don't do anything too quickly. Think about it. Take a breath. I think people react to information way too quickly because that information, there's no such thing as naked facts. If, you know, I like to say that the guy who won the Nobel Prize for saying that there all the information is in the market and therefore nobody can beat the market was just wrong. I mean, Yes, maybe a lot of the, almost all the information is in the markets, but two people can look at the same facts and interpret them differently. So it's not about the information that matters. It's the interpretation of the information that matters. And interpretation doesn't happen in an instant. You know, for example, with today's Powell's information, people are going to be mulling this for weeks. So what I tell people is don't rush, take a breath. Try and think about the information, interpret the information, and then eventually if you have to make a decision, you make a decision, but you don't have to make a decision. Dave, can I ask you, you mentioned earlier confidence and how important confidence is, and you know, particularly in the banking system now. Going back to 08, what, what seemed to happen there was confidence tipping over into hubris and the way that you guys dealt with that and you had the confidence to challenge that hubris, how do you mentally go about checking yourself, checking your ideas when you have confidence in an idea and making sure that you're not getting too dogmatic about it? You're not making, as you said, snap decisions and then folding an investment case around that decision. You're constantly checking it. How do you go about regulating that? Well, I have a couple of rules of thumb. Number one, investing is not a religion. Number two, don't be, the only thing that I'm actually wed to is my wife. I'm not wed to my position. I think too many people get completely wed to their positions and can't see that maybe eventually they're wrong. I think you need to be very data-driven and you need to keep an open mind because you could be wrong both ways. You could be wrong if you sell something too early because the fundamentals are still great and you're wrong. And you could be wrong in that you've owned something for a very long time and things are really changing and you don't sell it. So you have to just be open and keep working and tr try and develop as much information from as various sources as you can. 
So, so a good friend of mine once said to me that the difference between professional investors and retail investors is that professionals know how to sell. And I found that a really interesting insight. How do you know when to sell? Well, I mean, first of all, if you've held the position for a very long time, selling is difficult because, you know, capital gains taxes all combined is about 35%. You know, when capital gains taxes were combined 20%, it's a lot easier to sell. When it's 35%, there's a lot of pain. So you have to weigh, you know, look, if it's a 35% capital gains tax, the real fundamentals have to change a lot. Now, last year, for example, with, with tech stocks and hyper growth stocks down so much, it would have made sense to at least sell the hyper growth stocks. You know, when you're down 90%, it ain't easy to come back. So I think the decision is harder today because of the tax situation. But if you think that, so, you know, look, if a stock you've held for a long time, you think that, you know, the fundamentals are okay. They might be going through a short period of time where things are bad. And so the downside is 10 to 15%. You know, when that happens, it's painful, but longer term, it's better to hold it. On the other hand, if you think longer term, the fundamentals of the company are really out the window, then you have to sell and you have to just take the tax consequences. It's a very hard decision. What's your take on inflation and what do you suggest investors, how do they position themselves? just to protect themselves? That's not an easy question. I mean, look, I think the operative question that now is inflation going to really roll over. Sometimes I think people focus on the wrong things. They look at the number, the inflation number, but I think the Fed is actually more focused on sticky inflation, which is mostly what the most important data point is waging. Wages keep going up. Now they may be going up a little less than they were in the past. But they're still going up pretty strongly. So unless wages really roll over, I think we're in a higher interest rate environment for longer. And if that's the case, you do not want to go back at all to hyper growth stocks. And I don't think you necessarily want to be overweight or dramatically overweight tech. You want to be much more diversified in various different and can I ask you about the dollar? Obviously, it's been such a focus for so many people lately, and it's become a really dogmatic argument on both sides without much kind of gray in the middle. What are your thoughts on the dollar? What's happening on the bigger picture and also the shorter term likely moves on it? I have no views on the dollar short term. I think the longer term debate that people are having is the government debt in the United States too high so that the dollar will lose its res you know, reserve currency status. I think it's hard to have an opinion about that, but what I would say to people who think that the deficits are way too high and the dollar is going to lose its currency, reserve currency status is, everybody should have a little humility on this today because the people who say the deficit is too high have been making that argument for the last 30 years. Now. In our business, if you're early, you can be wrong. But early generally means like I'm a year too early. Being 30 years too early is pretty extreme. So <laughs> look, maybe the thesis is correct. But like I said, when you, you're, you're wrong for 30 years, have some humility. You better have a lot of data to show that you're right finally because you've been wrong for so long. That's all I have to say on the matter. Just a reminder, everybody, that we're welcome welcoming you to please ask any questions you have of Stephen. I don't see any requests coming in. Surprised, I thought I'd see one at least from you already. Oh, we have somebody requesting. I'm going to add you as a speaker right now. Rui, yo, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Please ask your question, Stephen. I just have a question. There was a point when the dollar was not reserve currency, and this was the period when the pound was the reserve currency. And there was a period before that when the pound was not the reserve currency, which was the Dutch currency that was the reserve currency. So there's these cycles that's happening. And I think you're failing to understand that, you know, there's a historical precedence to reserve currencies being, you know, pushed back and having new reserve currencies, you know, arise. So I don't think you're 
I don't think you're correct on this matter. Okay. Well, I mean, I don't want to be critical because everybody's in opinion. Oh, Steve, you got muted out a little bit there. We they can't hear this. What I would say to the speaker is that one of the reasons why the dollar is still the reserve currency of the world is that the U.S. bond market is the deepest and most liquid bond market in the world. And so until some other, some other country's bond market is as, at least close as as big and liquid, I just can't see the dollar losing its reserve capacity. That doesn't mean it won't necessarily eventually happen, but a lot has to happen, I think, in the bond market for that to happen. Just a friendly reminder that I am Kim Ann Curtin, the Wall Street coach and the only Discord room dedicated to supporting my set of traders and investors called TraderHeroJourney.com. Grant Williams, our co-host here, has some of the most educational podcasts out there in all of finance investing and for traders. Okay, we have another question here from Artie. Artie, feel free to ask your question, Stephen, and I'm glad to have you here, Artie. Hope you're well. Thank you so much, Kim. And so firstly, Steve, I just wanted to say huge fan of yours. I have your quote about you know, taking leverage is genius. And I truly live by those words. And I'm welcome to Twitter, of course. My question is about like tail risk in the market. And is there a tail risk you think the market is kind of underpricing right now uh, with the rates being high? And the reason I'm asking this question is because, you know, we're looking at S&P 500 earning yield somewhere around the 5%. And you have the Fed's fund rate at around 5%. The risk to reward doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem to me that the equity market has really priced in higher rates. So, you know, it's kind of a two-part question if you think there's a tail risk that the market is underpricing and if you're concerned with the rates. Thank you. Thank you for your question. What I would say is, you know, the market at its current level, I would be chasing it. I don't think, for example, that a recession is pricing the market right now. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean a recession is going to happen, but if it does happen, and like I said, I don't know if it does, the market definitely not price for that. So, you know, like I said, the concept of risk adjusted yield has to come back because anybody who is over invested at this point, I think is taking a lot of risk. So my response to people is don't be a hero, be careful. Marty, did you have a follow-up to that? No, absolutely. I got my answer. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, Steve, we have a couple of other questions here. I'm just going to add them in now. Tortuga, please, what's your question for Stephen? Hi, Stephen, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for taking the time to chat. I just followed you and uh, very excited to have you on Twitter. I've been following you for a while. And super excited that you're on here. Well, there's no point in following me for a while on Twitter since I only have it for two weeks. <laughs> yeah, I was. But I just I saw you only. Have, have, I will have more. I, I <laughs> saw you only have a hundred and something followers. That's absurd. But I'm happy that you're on here. And um, Stanley just joined it since we started this. Yeah, <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> I had two quick questions for you. The first one is, uh, you mentioned about the change in the paradigm, specifically in areas of the areas that you're looking at, infrastructure, reshoring, industrial. I was wondering if you could go in a little bit more sort of what specific companies or investments you're looking at in those spaces and sort of the, maybe the characteristics that you're looking for, et cetera. That seems to be an area that likely, I assume you're thinking it's going to be largely fiscally driven or, or at least that's what I'm assuming, but you know, feel free to to comment on that as well. And then the second area that I'm, I'm wondering about is, and forgive me if, if maybe I joined this a little late because I didn't know it was happening, but I was wondering if you'd comment on emerging markets. There seems to be, I would think, a consensus view around emerging markets growing faster than the US over the next, in this coming paradigm shift. Uh, if you've already talked about it, please disregard the question. I'll just go back and listen to the beginning. But that was the second part. First of all, thank you for your question. Let me take your second question first, because it's an easier, it's one easier for me to answer, which is I have no opinion on emerging markets. I don't generally do any research on them. I'm almost solely confined to the United States. What I like to say about it is 
there are enough opportunities in the United States for me to be wrong. And I don't need to add to that potential by doing stuff in the merchant market. So I just want to confine myself to areas that I, I think I'll make few of mistakes. As far as the first question is concerned, I generally don't like to talk about individual stocks. I'm like, everybody that goes on CNBC and start talking about their best. Yes. But I'll just talk about some. Number one, the infrastructure in the United States is a pull. You know, in New York, for example, the governor has decreed that almost every building in the city has to move from gas operated stoves to electric operated stoves. Now, leaving aside the immense expense of that, there's no way the electrical grid in New York City could withstand it. So I think one of the themes that's going to happen in the next several years, especially with the creation of electronic vehicles, is we're going to have to move the grid in the United States, and it's going to cost billions upon billions of dollars. So if you can find companies that are involved in that, I think that's going to be a wonderful theme. The second theme which is more difficult to invest in would be greenification. The reason why I think it's harder to invest is that the solar companies, for example, have crazy valuation. But I would do some work on them because assuming I'm right about the paradigm shift, the valuation of the companies. And the third theme that I would do work on, which is also more difficult to do, it gets it's hard to figure out at this point who benefits, but it will become clearer over time. Is you know one of the lessons of COVID is that while the supply chain of the world, the global supply chain was very inexpensive and was very deflationary, it was also much more brittle than people ever imagined. But that got exposed to COVID, and so if I'm a company, let's say in the United States. I don't want to want my supply chain to be in China. I want it to leave some of it to be closer to home. And so there will be companies that benefit as, 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 you know, the reshoring of the industrial world moves back to America. You know, who those companies are, it's not clear. I have a couple of ideas about it. But one thing I would just point out is that if the supply chain, a lot of it's going to get reshored to the United States, that's somewhat inflationary. And would mean that inflation will stay higher than people think because things cost more to make in the United States than they do in Vietnam. Tortuga, did you have some follow up to that? No, I think that was uh, I put the, the answer. And thank you for that, Steve. Sure. Any time. We have another question from Porter. What's your question for Stephen? Thanks. Hello, Stephen. Porter is, Porter, is that you? That is me. I just want to say that Porter Collins was one of my favorite partners, although all my partners were my favorite, when we were doing our thing at the front point in the years 2004 through 2011. Okay, Porter, take it away. All right, all right. So, you know, on the most recent podcast, you were talking a lot about some of the, I'd call them financials and drag. And, you know, since we have our expertise in financials, you know, that there's a lot of these stocks that want to be tech stocks, but you know, tech stocks don't really, except for the big ones, don't really make much money. And so they try to masquerade as tech stock, but they're really financials. And so what do you think? Like, I mean, there's, the list is long, but, you know, you got anywhere from, you know, fake solar companies like Sunrun, which are really gain on sale leasing companies to, you know, Lemonade, Trepanion, Square, the list goes on. It, what do you think finally happens to those? Do you think this is just time that people wake up and figure it out or? Well, I, 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 look, I understand the question. Yep. Well, first of all, oftentimes on the sell side, I just think the wrong people cover the stock. You know, there's some solar companies, you know, one you mentioned that are really financial companies and they're covered by tech, you know, tech analysts who know absolutely literally zero about financial companies. You know, Trepanion is one. It's a, you know, Trepanion is a company, you know, not that it has this side, but this is an example. Trepanion is an animal health insurance company that basically gets its business by having its salespeople call and visit veterinary. So it has literally nothing to do with the internet or tech. And yet, like the firm that bought the public assigned its internet analysts to the company. 
So I think over time, you know, especially with rates being higher, this whole masquerade of companies is going to end. You know, it may take a couple of years, but you know, so, some of these companies that are masquerading as tech companies, it's laughable. But it will take time, but I think it's going to happen. All right. And my second question is, we've seen this before in financials when they just go down every day. I remember in, in 2007 or 2008, or actually, sorry, 2009, in the beginning of 2009, the financials literally went down every day from January 1st to about March 9th, right? They just, they did four or 5% a day. And obviously this environment is different, but you know, there's some worse or some things are better. And, you know, I think you and I were both hoping regulation was going to be a little bit better, but, you know, there's some ap- aspects of it that they were, you know, overlook- overlooked and, the, you know, whoever the regulator was, and, you know, for these banks didn't do that great of a job. So why don't you just give your assessment of the current landscape of financials? You know, it's all, it's funny. We always fight the last war. You know, the last war was credit. So how do you solve a credit problem? You dramatically reduce leverage and you force banks to improve their whole credit decision-making process. This is a new war. This is really almost, this has nothing to do with credit. It has to do with the fact that the Fed lowered rates to zero and companies, banks like Silicon Valley had simply bought short-term bonds for, and their deposits are probably short-term as well. They would have made a lot less money, but they would have been in much more, in better long-term shape. But instead, everybody got greedy. They didn't want to report bad earnings to Wall Street. So they bought long-term bonds basically at the bottom so they could show net interest margins that were good. You know, now with rates much higher, they're essentially upside down on their portfolios. You know, Silicon Valley, just as an example, on a mark-to-market basis, its equity was less than zero. That is not an easy problem to solve, but it's not impossible as long as deposits don't glee the banks. The problem I think that we're having right now is that deposits aren't necessarily fleeing because people are afraid. They're fleeing because they can get much better rates of money market funds. And so what I worry about is that assuming rate, the Fed keeps rates higher for longer, the trend to move money out of banks into money market funds is going to continue. Some banks, I mean, all the banks are having to pay up their deposits by increasing the rates that they're giving their saving customers, depositors. If that's all that happens, the only thing that happens to the banks is that the earnings will not go down. If what happens is people start pulling their money completely out of the bank because they're worried, then the banks are going to have to sell their securities and we're going to have more Silicon Valley situation. My hope is that it's only the former, but you can't say the latter is not possible. And then I guess you have you know, the fear of credit right around the corner, right? And so it's just, it's not a great combination. Well, I mean, the credit situation is interesting in the sense that I don't think this is going to be, unless we have an unbelievably severe recession, which is not my base case yep. at all. You're not going to have a consumer credit quality problem. What you're going to have, I think, is an office credit quality problem. And that's not a universal problem for all the banks. It's not a problem for the large banks. It's going to probably be a problem if it happens in the CMBS market. And it's going to be a problem with certain regional banks that are overexposed to office. You know, the interesting thing about office is, you know, when consumer credit quality deteriorates, it happens fast. For office, it's going to take time. So, yeah. you know, we may not see this real problem materialize till next year. Yep, I agree. All right, Stephen, good to hear from you. Well, Porter, Paul, okay, before, Porter. before you go away, there was a question that came in. Steve, just watch that background noise. The mic is very sensitive, so it picks up everything, I'm sad to say. Okay. This is a question that came into my DMs. You got the guys using an anonymous Twitter handle, so you guys will have to tell me if this is a legit question. But he says that he is done. You know, both of you guys from his Atlas days when they were running, fr- when you both were running from point, his question is about, do higher rates start to play an issue for when do higher rates start to play an issue for private equity and private credit? Well, I'll take that. So it's, it's already had an, it's already taken an issue with respect to that. And the reason is that because of higher rates, as I mentioned before, 
if stocks that got obliterated in 2022 were the hyper growth stock. Today. The reason venture capital is having such a problem is that the quality of venture capital companies. So these companies did round one and round two, and now round three, if they were to raise any money, which they probably can't, would be an evaluation 80% of Venture capital, I think, is going to go through a very long period of time because nobody likes, generally, people don't like to invest in companies where the new valuation is 80%. Too many people. I have an idea of complicated. They generally don't invest in companies that have the same qualities. But I think that the problem with private equity that it might have is that it's a lot easier to make a private equity investment where rates are 1% than where rates are. 5%, 6%, or 7%, because that's where you're going to have to fund it. So I just think it's going to be, you need a valuation adjustment. If you bought something when things were at 1%, and now you want to buy a similar thing when rates are 6%, the valuation of that thing has to be much lower. But I, and that's not happening yet. So I think it's in private equity, it's going to do a lot less than it did in the past. That's my guess. We'll see what happens. I guess my quick take on that is that it's, you know, in real estate, it's more of an issue because it's harder to change the EBITDA, like fix, you know, you can fix a company, but it's really, it's, it's a lot harder to change the underlying EBITDA of a, of a real estate company, of a real estate project, unless, you know, fix it up a lot. So I, I think the rates are, you know, the ongoing CMBS maturities are, is going to be like water torture. And it's going to, it's going to be that way until, you know, the Fed cuts rates, I think. And then the other issue where higher rates is going to bite eventually is going to be at the United States sovereign, right? And as lower yielding debt rolls off, they're going to have to increasingly fund it at higher and higher rates. And so those are the two areas that I'm thinking about. Stephen, we have 560 people in our Twitter space, so I'm hoping you're willing to stay a little bit longer because I know we've got... Yeah, before we do that, yeah. I just want to make a pitch. Yeah, please. You know, the Eisman Group takes please. takes investors anywhere from 500000 to a million. The reason why we don't take below that is it requires just as much time to make investment decisions for a small group, small fund amount of money than a large amount of money, so we have limited space. But anybody who is interested in investing with us, my email address is steven.eisman at nb.com. You could shoot me an email. And, and your DMs. Okay, got it. That was my pitch. That's good. That's good. I will keep, was, yeah. I will keep letting you do your pitch because people will want to know how to get your wisdom for their portfolio. So I'm very glad you did that. This is a part two of a two-part conversation. I have a podcast called The Wall Street Coach. My name is Kim Ann Curtin. The Wall Street Coach podcast with part one and this Twitter space will drop in about two weeks. I'm very fortunate to have a Discord room, the only Discord room dedicated to supporting the mindset of traders and investors called TraderHeroJourney.com. And Grant Williams is my amazing co-host for this. And if you haven't heard Grant Williams' conversation with Stephen, Please listen to it. It dropped just about a week ago, and it's a fantastic interview. Graham, you haven't asked a question for a while. We have so many people online. I know Jim has a question, but Grant, why don't you go first if there's any other questions you've been holding on to? Yeah, I know. This, I think we've got, we've got a whole bunch. They're all desperate to get the chance to speak to Steve. I feel a bit guilty for keep asking questions. <laughs> so why don't we bring some more people up from the floor? Okay. It, just, it just feels like I, I had a chance and we could okay. do it. And I took every second okay. of that. So why don't, we bring, uh, why don't we bring the next Jim, one up? Jim is here. You, your turn, Jim. Hi. Thank you. Yeah, quick question. There, there's been a lot of talk about the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. And, and one t interesting part, I don't hear a lot of people talk about. But I guess when the U.S. dollar was set up as a reserve currency, there's a theory called Triffin's Dilemma, where Robert Triffin, the economist, when it was first set up, he pretty much stated that having a country's a national currency as a reserve currency would eventually fail because what would happen is the whole the national country would not be able to create enough of their currency to support the global economy. And I think that's interesting. So essentially it would lead to like a global 
dollar shortage. And I think that's a little bit of a contrarian view, but I think in a lot of ways, it's tending to play out somewhat, even, you know, given the amount of national debt that we have and amount, you know, amount of dollars that have been created, it's like there's still this shortage in the global economy in terms of like the transaction currency with dollars. So I was just curious what your thoughts were on that, if you felt like it had any legitimacy and see what your thoughts are on that. I mean, the whole dollar reserve currency, I have to admit, is that a little bit above my pay grade, as I like to say. The only thing I'll say about it, and I don't have any theory about it, is that as long as the U.S. bond markets are the biggest and most liquid bond markets in the world, I just don't see an alternative to the dollar being reserved. If some other country like China had a, a bond market as deep and as liquid in the U.S., I think we could have a debate about that. I just don't see an alternative as long as the bond situation. Connor, what's your question? I've just made you a speaker. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Kim, and thanks to you and to Grant for hosting this discussion. And Stephen, I'm a longtime admirer of your work, so thanks for your, taking the time and for sharing your insights on this. I listened to your, your previous remarks just on paradigm shifts and deglobalization and onshoring and so on. And I just, I share a similar view in that I believe that this cycle's tech space, so to speak, will be in the real asset space or the real economy. And in, I'd, in, within that, I'd include things like infrastructure, commodities, energy, you know, real businesses that actually have social and economic utility in terms of products and services. And I just think it's interesting that, you know, it, it seems to me that, you know, what has worked the last cycle, i.e. tech, isn't going to work this cycle, but yet many investors still seem to be honing in on the tech space. And, you know, we've seen kind of a rebound in tech equity values recently as well. Uh, I'm just wondering, I mean, do you, do you have any thoughts on kind of, the, you know, the real asset or commodity spaces, maybe the, being this cycle's kind of tech sector in terms of out, outperformance? And if so, how do you think that outperformance might be achieved, given that due to ESG constraints, many institutional investors still can't own or won't own things like, you know, coal or, you know, traditional fossil fuel and energy businesses or other kind of perceived dirty businesses. So just curious to hear any thoughts you might have on that. Thanks. Uh, sure. I generally don't have opinions on commodity prices. <laughs> generally speaking, I have found that people who just predict prices of commodities are only right for a short period, which is too hard to predict. So I generally don't do anything in the mind. That's just my credit. I do think that anything related to infrastructure, anything, and even the simplest thing is anything related to the grid long-term is going to be well. You know, like I said before, in New York, the governor is now requiring people to re eventually replace all their gas stove with electronic stove. Just imagine what, the amount of how difficult that's going to be. But if it starts, you know, the grid in the, in, in the New York area breaks down somewhat. We have brownouts in New York in, in the summer as it. You do this, there's no way the grid can handle it. So the hardening of the grid, the improvement of the grid, that I think is going to be one of the biggest things in the next several years. I mean, there are a whole bunch of companies involved, and I think that's one thing that everybody understands. Nick, I've unmuted your mic. What's your question for Stephen? Thanks, Ken. Steve, thanks for taking the time to do this. So there's kind of this idea out there right now that we may be seeing some growth happening within the lower class, the lower middle class as well. And I'm just curious, you know, if that's something that you're also keeping an eye on, and if so, what are maybe some signposts that you're looking at? Is it purely just wages? Is there anything else that might start to point to that being true and trending in that direction? Thanks so much. That's a great question. I've been thinking about a lot this time because, you know, when you, if you recall the 2008 terrible recession really impacted the middle and lower middle class because of how homes, their homes were the, was their biggest asset class. And the average home in the United States went down 30%. So for the middle class and lower middle class, that was such I think it's going to be very different this time. You know, if you look at where layoffs are taking place, it's in tech, 
and it's on Wall Street. But you have not heard of any layoffs, industrial services, et cetera. And I think the reason for that is because of COVID, a very high percentage of those kind of workers just left the workforce. And so you're hearing all over the place that there's a shortage of workers and companies are still hiring because they need those workers and they don't have a choice, even though it's hurting their margin. So I think assuming the government's an assumption that we go into a recession, this recession, I think, will impact the high end. And, you know, for example, office real estate is not owned by middle class and lower middle class. It's owned by the upper class. So I think assuming we go into some recession, the group that's going to be hurt the worst is the very is the high end and the very high end and not the middle class and the lower middle class. I think they will hold up much better. I think wages will probably hold up much better. And I'm watching wages very carefully every month to see if that proves to be correct. WLV, you've been waiting a long time to ask your question. I'm sorry it took so long to get to you. Please switch your question for Stephen. Thanks for being here. Okay. I'm not sure what happened there. Okay. Mr. Jerome Powell, <laughs> You're, the mic is yours. What's your question for Stephen? Hi, guys. Hi, Stephen and Porter. I, I, I knew you guys from a while ago when I was at Atlas and you guys were at Front Point. So it was a large LP years and years ago. But to have a specific question that came in addressed with respect to private equity. And so this is more around this framework of sponsor-owned companies that have been leveraged to the max over the last decade with, you know, the lowest possible interest coverage ratio and a lot of tranches, the 1L, 2L, the PICs, the PREFs, all ahead of the sponsor's equity, right? We're going from low all-in yield environment to a relatively higher and uncertain one. So even if we assume multiples remain the same and that cash flow generated from the companies before debt is the same, won't there be some serious issue in refinancings as a senior secured debt will have to be refinanced at much higher coupon vintages? These yields are somewhere two to three. No, no, I, I believe I hear, I hear your, I hear your question. Yeah. I think the first obvious place that's going to, that's going to take place is an office because it's very clear that a lot of buildings are bought at very low rates and the cash flows are way down. So about 175 billion of office real estate is going to be refinanced this year and 150 billion is going to be refinanced next year. So that's the obvious place to look for problem. Um, what you're talking about is private equity companies where let's say the fundamentals are still the same, but they have to refinance at much higher rate. I'll be perfectly honest. I don't have the data yet to know how much private equity debt is going to get refinanced over the next couple of years. If it's very high, it's going to be a problem. If it's termed out, I, you know, it'll, it'll be a problem for the, the tomorrow. So I, I don't have the data to really answer your question because I don't really know when most of this debt is coming to. Stephen, why don't you tell people how they can reach out to you if they want to, what your email is in addition to your Twitter handle. Please sure. let me recommend everybody follow Stephen now. His Twitter handle hasn't been that active, so be sure to follow him. And of course, our co-host Grant Williams. Where can they find you, Stephen? Well, I mean, I'm going to be much more active on Twitter now, so you could reach out to me there. And anybody who's interested in investing with us, my email address is stephen.eisman at n as in nancy, b as in boy, dot com. We're always willing to talk to people to invest. And like, you know, like I said earlier, we manage multi-generational families and we don't look at, you know, when I look at the portfolio of someone, I don't treat them as a number. I actually know the person personally. And that definitely makes it very different to invest in people when you know them individually. I think one of the things I admire the most about you is how you shoot straight from the hip and never mince words. And that's why I am such a happy camper that you'll be on Twitter. Because if Twitter is one thing, it's a place to, for people who shoot straight from the hip. All right, we have a question now from WLV. Hopefully your mic's working this time. What's your question for Stephen? Thank you so much for another opportunity. Uh, I was just wondering, Stephen, if you could kind of expound on your current thoughts of the housing market and kind of um, its impact on potentially reaccelerating inflation. I know a lot of inflation hawks have 
point to that firming up of the housing market as a potential upside risk. And I would just love to hear a few of your thoughts on, you know, if your base case isn't a massive recession, then potentially what does the housing market do in that scenario? I don't have a really a base case at this point. I'm sort of an agnostic. I'm not really sure what's going to happen, whether it's going to be a slowdown, a mild recession, a severe recession. I just don't think we have enough data at this point to make a very strong conclusion one way or the other. I am surprised that housing has come back as strong as it has. If you look at the whole publicly traded home builders, their earnings have soared this year, which I actually was shocked by. So it looks like people have gotten at least used to higher rates for the moment. I don't see a credit issue yet in terms of individual housing. So, you know, the problems that happened in 08, I don't see recurring. Whatever, assuming we have a recession, and like I said, it's an assumption, I don't think that problems will take place in the residential housing market. That's just my view at this point. I think you really should be looking to, look, we always have a tendency to fight the last war. So because there were such problems in the residential mortgage market in 2008, everybody's expecting, oh, it has to happen again. Well, it doesn't have to happen again. Things can move, things can change. I'm fairly convinced at this point that whatever credit quality issues happen this time around, it's probably not going to happen in the consumer. It's going to happen in commercial real estate, in companies that are over levered. That's where I think the focus could be. Artie, what's your question for Stephen? Yeah, thanks, Kim, for bringing me on again. We talked a lot, Steve, about rates during this spaces. And my question is, do you think that lower bound zero of interest rate, that zero phenomenon basically is dead? Or once things get a little tougher, we're going to go back to it. Like, have you learned our lesson? That was probably not a good policy solution or no? A, I agree. It wasn't a great policy solution, although I think hard to play Monday morning quarterback when, you know, the world's imploding because everybody's getting sick. So I don't blame the Fed for lowering rates to zero because, you know, we had a pandemic and nobody really knew what to do. I do think ZERP is dead because I think maybe inflation slows a lot, but it's not going to go back to anywhere what it was because of the reshoring, at least for the reshoring of the supply chain in America. Inflation will be higher. I don't think it goes back to 2%. Maybe it goes to 3 if we're lucky. And, but that means rates are just going to stay higher. I really think we're not going to go back to zero rate unless there's some unbelievable calamity that we're completely unaware. Vinny, the mic is yours. We're really glad to have you here. Awesome. And thank you. I just want to thank Grant for doing this and getting Steve on Twitter to do this. Steve, welcome. I'm glad you're on Twitter. And well, and I just want to point out to the audience that this is another one of my favorite ex-partners. It was Porter we heard from, and this is Vincent Daniel. Uh, so go ahead, Vinny. And so the one recommendation I would have for you is just in terms of Twitter follow, probably the best Twitter follow is Super 70 Sports. If you haven't followed that yet, it will be right up your alley. Okay. Just that's my one recommendation. I'm just going to sit and listen, and I thank you for doing this. Oh, thank you. JR, what's your question? Thanks for waiting. You just have to unmute your mic. Yes, thank you. I have just a very basic question um, that I've been thinking about lately. It revolves around global liquidity and how much of a factor that plays into the market. I've been hearing some podcasts from a gentleman named Mike Hall, Crossborough Capital, who you know claims that we're going to be approaching a an upswing in liquidity. I'm just quite curious how much that plays into your market process. I don't have a great answer for you on that. I'll, you know, I, I'll answer questions where I think I have the answer and I'll say I don't know to questions that I don't. You know, people like to say the market's going to go, go down only so much because the liquidity is so high. And that was true in 07 and 08 as well. So I just have a good answer for you. I just don't. Okay, appreciate that. Just a friendly reminder, guys, to follow Steve, who Steven's on Twitter now. He has very few followers because he hasn't been active, but 
Nike's first tweet is actually his interview with Grant Williams from about a week ago. I strongly recommend you guys listen to that. My name is Kim Ann Curtin. I am the Wall Street coach, and I have the only Discord group. Kim? Yeah. Okay, we have Dear Point, who's been waiting to ask a question. You can unmute your mic now. Thanks for waiting. Thank you, Kim. And uh, Steve, it's a pleasure speaking with you. A question for you. I, I know before you were short the Canadian banks, I'm not sure if you still have any thoughts on them. Obviously, you know, over the past couple of years, they haven't really had a credit cycle. Still negatively loan loss provisioning as, you know, gross impaired loans are increasing. All of that still stayed relatively the same. And I guess if we kind of look at, you know, the monetary framework and everything that's going on, it, it seems like Canada is going to have a bit of a problem coming up here. I'm not sure if you have any thoughts there. Well, first, I would say that I've been short the Canadian banks on and off for years, and I've, I've been consistent wrong. Now, maybe a credit cycle starts in Canada finally. I guess the problem with shorting any of the Canadian banks is that the Canadian banking system is an oligopoly. So the inherent profitability of the Canadian banks is probably amongst the highest in the world. I'm just not close enough now to what's happening in terms of credit to have any strong opinion about the Canadian banks. If I had to guess, I would say they might have a credit cycle, but it's just, it just not going to be that good. That's my guess at this point. But I'm just not close enough anymore because, you know, having been wrong for so long, I gave up. <laughs> what's your question, Rustin? Hey, thank you, Stephen, for taking the time. I joined 15 minutes ago when you were talking about infrastructure, and I'd love to dig a bit deeper and learn, you know, what are some parts of the infrastructure that you've been spending more of your time focused on? I think you mentioned at some point that the grid need in the U.S. need to go through upgrade. So it'd be interesting to get a sense of where you see some of the opportunities, particularly with respect to power generation within the points in front. Thank you. Well, the interesting thing about the power generation situation is that while the utilities are very much involved in it, you know, other than a company like Nextera, which has a lot of alternative energy sources, you know, the, all the utilities are trying to do that, but they're years away. And whatever changes to the grid that are needed to be made, the utilities actually don't do it. There are companies that do it for them, and they're not a lot of them. So you know, there's a handful of them, and they're all worth looking at. The other companies that are worth looking at and to do homework on at this point are the solar companies, but you know, the valuations are nosebleed for most of them. They've all had a pretty big correction of late, a lot of it because there was a lot of pull forward of solar during COVID. So the valuations are lower, but they're still not at levels that I think are investable. So, but what I would do is do a lot of homework on them and just sit and wait. We have time for your question and this non, we're going to then let Stephen go so he can get to his other event. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I can hear you. Hi, right, thank you all. Steve, I just want to... How would you compare the office situation to uh, to the malls? That's been a ten year NOI shrink, over levered, over over built space too, and it doesn't seem like it's hurt the banks too bad. Thanks. Like I said before, in terms of where who has a lot of office, it's the CMBS market. Now, who owns that CMBS? I don't think I know. I don't think anybody knows at this point. And then there are these regional banks, there's a fairly long list of them, but it's not an endless list that have a lot of office exposure. I, the one reason why I think office may show up as a problem much more quickly than malls is that, like I said before, 175 billion of debt is going to be, you have to re refinance this year of office debt. And then 150 billion has to be refinanced next year. That's a lot of debt. And if I'm right about the problems in office happening, going to be very hard to refinance that debt when you have a combination of much higher cap rates and declining cash flows. So I think within the next year to two years, you're going to see that problem really emerge. 
Stephen, thank you so much. Reminder, guys, this is part two of a two-part interview that I was fortunate enough to have with Stephen. My podcast is The Wall Street Coach. That podcast, which will be part one with a video conversation with Stephen and then his Twitter space edited on at the end, will probably drop in about two weeks. Stephen, is there anything you want to say before you close your first Twitter space with me? Well, you know, I really enjoyed that, my first one, and hopefully we'll do it again sometime. I hope we can. Thank you so much for coming here today. I want to thank Grant Williams for also coming in to co-host with us. And again, if you haven't heard Grant Williams' conversation with Stephen, please listen to that. And we'll see you guys on the Wall Street Coach podcast in two weeks with this full episode with Stephen. I hope you have a great evening, Stephen. Thanks again for coming. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank thank you. Okay. Aloha. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This has been the Wall Street Coach podcast with Kim Ann Curtin. You can find out more about her and her team online at thewallstreetcoach.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please consider leaving a five-star review on iTunes. Thank you for listening.